If you're watching this video, you're using the internet. It's not a series of tubes, and it's not invented by Al Gore. I'm going to do another video where I go over the history of the internet, but in this video I'm just going to show you the basics of how the internet works as a tool. Essentially, the internet is the technical infrastructure that makes the web possible. In less than 20 years, the internet has expanded to link up around 210 different nations. Even some of the world's poorest developing nations are now connected. Think of it like a telephone network, or a network of highways that crisscross the world. Telephones and highways are networks, just like the internet. The things you say on the telephone and the traffic that travels down roads run on top of the basic network. In the same way, things like the World Wide Web, which is the information pages we can browse online, messaging programs, MP3 music downloading, and file sharing are all things that run on top of the basic computer network that we call the internet. The internet is a collection of standalone computers, and also computer networks in companies, schools, colleges, and more, all loosely linked together. The connections between the computers are a mixture of old-fashioned copper cables, fiber optic cables, wireless radio connections, and satellite links. The internet has one simple job to move computerized information, also known as data, from one place to another. The machines that make up the internet treat all the information they handle in the exact same way. The internet kind of works like a postal service. Letters are simply passed from one place to another, no matter who they are from or what messages they contain. The job of the mail service is to move letters from place to place. The internet's simplicity means it can handle many different kinds of information, helping people to do many different jobs. It's not specialized to handle emails, web pages, or anything else. All information is handled equally and passed on in the exact same way. Because the internet is so simply designed, people can easily use it to run new applications that run on top of the basic computer network. For example, two European inventors developed Skype, which is a way of making telephone calls over the internet, and all they had to do was write a program that could turn speech into internet data and back again. They didn't have to rebuild the entire internet to make Skype possible. I just want to note here that I'm not trying to say that it's easy to make Skype. Much of the internet runs on the ordinary public telephone network, but there's a big difference between how a telephone call works and how the internet carries data. If you ring a friend, your telephone opens a direct connection, or circuit, between your home and theirs. If you had a big map of the worldwide telephone system, you could theoretically mark a direct line all the way from your phone to the phone in your friend's house. As long as you're on the phone, the circuit stays permanently open between your two phones. This way of linking phones together is called circuit switching. In the old days, when you made a call, someone sitting at a switchboard pulled wires in and out to make temporary circuits that connected one home to another. Now the circuit switching is done automatically by an electronic telephone exchange. If you think about it, circuit switching is a really inefficient way to use a network. All the time you're connected to your friend's house, no one else can get through to either of you by phone. Think about being on a computer and typing an email for one hour or more, and no one being able to email you while you were doing so. Even though you're not actually sending information down the line, the circuit is still connected and still blocking other people from using it. The internet could theoretically work by circuit switching, and some parts of it still do. If you have a traditional dial-up connection, where your computer dials a telephone number to reach your internet service provider, you're using circuit switching to go online. And some of you may remember just how inefficient this was. Most data moves over the internet in a completely different way called packet switching. Suppose you send an email to someone in China. Instead of opening up a long and convoluted circuit between your home and China and sending your email down it all in one go, the email is broken up into tiny pieces called packets. Each one is tagged with its ultimate destination and allowed to travel separately. In theory, all the packets could travel by totally different routes. When they reach their ultimate destination, they're reassembled to make the email again. Packet switching is much more efficient than circuit switching. You don't have to have a permanent connection between the two places that are communicating for a start, so you're not blocking an entire chunk of network each time you send a message. Many people can use the network at the same time, and since your packets can flow by different routes, depending on which ones are quietest or busiest, the whole network is used more evenly, which makes for quicker and more efficient communication all around. There are hundreds of millions of computers on the internet, but they don't all do exactly the same thing. Some of them are like electronic filing cabinets that store information and pass it on when requested, and these machines are called servers. Machines that hold ordinary documents are called file servers, ones that hold people's mail are called mail servers, and the ones that hold web pages are web servers. There are tens of millions of servers on the internet. A computer that gets information from a server is called a client. When your computer connects over the internet to a mail server at your internet service provider, or ISP, your computer is the client and the ISP computer is the server. And there are far more clients on the internet than servers. When two computers on the internet swap information back and forth on a more or less equal basis, they are known as peers. If you use an instant messaging program to chat to a friend and you start swapping photos back and forth, you're taking part in what's called peer-to-peer -peer or P2P communication. 
In P2P, the machines involved sometimes act as clients and sometimes as servers. For example, if you send a photo to your friend, your computer is the server supplying the photo, and your friend's computer is the client accessing the photo. If your friend sends you a photo in return, the two computers switch roles. Apart from clients and servers, the internet is also made up of intermediate computers called routers, whose job is essentially to make connections between different systems. If you have several computers at your home or school, you probably have a single router that connects all of them to the internet. The router is like the mailbox at the end of your street. It's a single point of entry to the worldwide network. The real internet doesn't involve moving with the help of envelopes, and the information that flows back and forth can't be controlled by people like you and me. And that's probably just as well given how much data flows over the internet each day, roughly 3 billion emails, and the huge amount of traffic downloaded from the world's millions of websites and billions of users. If everything is sent by packet sharing, and no one really controls it, how does the vast mass of data ever reach its destination without getting lost? The answer is called TCP IP, which stands for Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol. It's the internet's fundamental control system, and it's really two systems in one. In the computer world, a protocol is simply a standard way of doing things, a tried and trusted method that everyone follows to ensure things get done properly. So what do TCP and IP actually do? IP, or Internet Protocol, is simply the internet's addressing system. All the machines on the internet are identified by an internet protocol, or IP address, that takes the form of a series of digits separated by dots or colons. If all the machines have numeric addresses, every machine knows exactly how and where to contact every other machine. When it comes to websites, we usually refer to them by easy to remember names like www.google.com rather than their actual IP addresses. And there's a relatively simple system called DNS or domain name system that enables a computer to look up the IP address for any given website. In the original version of IP, known as IP version 4, addresses consisted of four pairs of digits. But the rapid growth in internet use meant that all possible addresses were used up by January of 2011. And this has prompted the introduction of a new IP system with more addresses, which is known as IP version 6, where each address is much longer. The other part of the control system, TCP, or Transmission Control Protocol, sorts out how packets of data move back and forth between one computer, in other words, one IP address, and another. It's TCP that figures out how to get the data from the source to the destination, arranging for it to be broken up into packets, transmitted, resent if they get lost, and reassembled into the correct order at the other end. The internet has made access to information and communication easier than ever before. Thanks for watching.